All right. So our woman in waiting, <laughs> is that true? Our woman in waiting this week is the woman with the issue of blood. We don't really know what her name is. Tradition has told, called, called her Veronica. So that's easy to do. Uh, we're going to look at Mark's rendition of this story in Mark chapter 5. It's in all three of the synoptic gospels. There's three gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, that are called synoptic, the same view. And then there's John that is just totally different, ethereal, heavenly kind of a thing. So these three gospels have this story in there. And in all three of them, it's what they call a Markin sandwich. It's a story within a story. You've got Jairus, and then you've got the story of the woman with the issue of the blood in the middle, and then it goes back out to Jairus' story. And so what we're going to look at today is this, the whole sandwich. We're not going to open up the bread and just look at the, PB, the, the peanut butter and jelly. We're going to look at the whole thing. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 5. The interesting thing about Mark chapter 5, the key words for Mark are like the, the words and, uh, immediately, some like the King James calls it straightway, and straightway he went to the next thing, and immediately he went over there. Yeah. He was just a man of action. It, you hardly have time to catch a breath. You put a period, and then you say, and then he did this. Mark presents Jesus as the servant of God. He's always doing, always going about the business. Doesn't tell us anything about his genealogy, doesn't tell us anything about his credentials. He just says, look at, and then he did this, and he did that. And so you're going to find that quite a bit in here. And in Mark chapter five, you get a lot of what Jesus is doing. Um, we see that he has power over demons when he heals the demoniac on the southwest side of the Sea of Galilee. You see that he has power over diseases when he heals the woman that we're studying tonight. And he has a power over death. Each time you read a miracle from Jesus, you want to ask that question. What does this demonstrate about Jesus and who he is? And, and what, what characteristics we have about him. Just an FYI, another thing that you want to ask yourself when you're studying the parables and the miracles is always write down what were the people's reactions. And you'll find out the religious leader have a way of reacting and the common people have a way of reacting. And then there's the disciples. Yeah. Huh? huh? So they honest. always have, yeah, so they always have a little bit of a dumbfounded look. <laughs> so uh, those are just a little Bible study hip tip. Um, so we're going to look at Mark chapter five. <clears throat> First of all, without reading the story of the man with the, dem the demons, you probably are familiar with the story if you haven't read it. And that's, the, that is the man who wandered around the tombs because he was possessed. It was on the Southeast corner east of Jordan, in the Gadarenes area, in the, in the region over there on the east side. And what you have there are people raising swine. This is Jewish territory. This is Gad's territory. Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben are on that side of the Jordan River, and they're raising pigs. I don't blame them. I mean, I like bacon too, but they are not supposed to. Well, Jesus floats over to the southeast sides. He ends up having an encounter with this demoniac in the, that's hanging out in the tombs. He's naked. He's cutting himself. He's, he's screaming. He's bursting, uh, breaking out the chain. This is somebody's son. This was somebody's Sunday school student. This was somebody's, you know, brother or and. Here he is in this situation, and everybody counted it as lost. They just put him in his tombs. They tried to chain him up. Well, Jesus has an encounter with him. It's the only thing he did when he was over there. He floated to the southeast as if he had to get there, meet this fellow, and then he, he went home again. So Jesus had this one encounter just with him, and this is where he casts out 2,000 demons into the swine, and they run over the cliff and are drowned. Now, that's very exciting. You would think the town people would be quite thrilled. They go and tell, hey, you know, you know, old Joe, the one who, you, you know, the one who you had in Sunday school 12 years ago, he's clothed and in his right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus. Come on and see. And they all run out to see and they're, they're marveling. You don't know how many times we've changed this guy up. You don't know how many times that we uh, try to hold him down and he just broke out. And they saw him clothed and in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. And they said to Jesus, could you leave? <laughs> you 
you know, you're really bad for business. <laughs> you know how much pigs are going for right now? You, we were basically doing this for the Roman Empire, and, and they were going to pay us a good, goodly amount to feed the armies. And so they asked Jesus to leave after they saw their fellow citizen who grew up among them be delivered. That's so odd, isn't it? And yet, if they hadn't asked Jesus that, if they hadn't shooed him away, it would have been too late for Jairus' daughter. And so in the orchestration, even poor choices that we make, our other people make, you think that was a bad decision. After Jesus left, there were other people, why, did you, why didn't you tell me I've got my daughter who's mute or I got my daughter, you know, why? So everyone's upset about this decision, but as a result, it was just in time for Jairus' daughter because they get to the other side and that's where what we're going to read unfolds. So even though we look on and say that was a bad choice, other people can say this is God's doing. He orchestrated it just so. So let's start in verse 21. I'll lock myself in here. Now, when Jesus had crossed from the southeast area of their Gergesenes or Gadarenes, depending on what translation you have. When Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him and he was by the sea. So there is this great multitude gathered there. They're waiting for him. I, I don't know if they got word about the demoniac and they were more excited on that side. Did you see the big wave that came across the lake? Was it like, what happened? Where did that come from? Well, that was because 2,000 pigs fell into the Sea of Galilee and it caused a tsunami on the other side. <laughs> I, I don't know what caused the great crowd to be there. Maybe they heard Jesus was coming, but there was a great multitude there to greet him. So much so that they were pressing in and thronging against him, as we're going to read in the other portions. And there they were, excited and thrilled to meet him. Other people, back in Gadarene, said, get out. These people are like, we are so glad you're here. Better put on my glasses to read. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet a ruler of the synagogue. How difficult would it have been to have Jesus in your church? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the upper echelon are saying, man, you need to quiet him down. You need to shut him down. No, he can't lead your Bible stories. No, he shouldn't be the youth minister. We need to calm him down. Everybody's raving about him, you know? So you got the upper echelon saying, shut him down. You got other people clamoring. Yeah, I'm going to synagogue. I heard, wait, you never go to synagogue. Yeah, but Jesus goes there. And so you have people crowding in, just come to see Jesus, like as if it was a circus act. And so Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue in Jesus's, not hometown, but his hub, this was his ministry hub of Capernaum, um, He's like, oh, that Jesus guy. When's he going on vacation? Like his, his approach was probably, I need to keep my distance. I don't want to choose to the right or to the left. I want to keep both parties satisfied here in the synagogue. And so there, this poor fella, I, I, I have sympathy for him, trying to keep everybody happy there in his synagogue. But when we are introduced to him, he is running, you might say. He is running to Jesus. It's as if it doesn't matter the religious controversy. It doesn't matter the political upheaval and what it's going to cost me. I don't care what they're saying next Sabbath service. I have a daughter who is knocking at death's door, and I want that need met. I mean, this is where at one point where parents can all relate to the story. The intensity of parental love, the kind of thing you would throw your reputation, you would be willing to lose your rulership over the synagogue. You would throw it all out if it could possibly mean my daughter or my son has a chance. What wouldn't a parent give for healing? And so we see Jairus is doing the running to go meet this controversial figure. He could care less about the cost. And we see wife stays with the child. 
Both parents are very much involved in this. We don't care the cost. Just find somebody. Do whatever it takes. I'm sure they didn't sit around the dinner table and think, I don't know, honey, we should draw up the pros and cons about what this is going to be like. They didn't even bother. He put on his running shoes, slammed the front door, and off he went. And he comes up to Jesus, and behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue named Jairus, um, guess what he does? He runs up to him. And somehow this crowd, he had an easier time getting through the crowd, I suspect, because of who he was. Because of his renown, his position in society, Jairus is coming and he's running. Everybody's thinking, well, that's a spectacle. Where, what other story did we read where he ran, where, where a man ran in the prodigal son story? And Jairus is running. Everybody's like, look, look at that spectacle. He's coming right at us. And everybody just kind of back away. And Jairus runs right up to Jesus. And he speaks in his authoritative tone and says, come. No, he doesn't. He falls down at his feet. And begs, Matthew calls it worship. Where, where did he have time to worship? Where, where's the praise song? Where's casting crowns? He had no time to worship <laughs> unless God takes our desperation, takes our begging and pleading, our cries of, Lord, help me, help my daughter, takes our pleas and our cries and our desperation. He says, look at the worship. Look at the worship. And so it says this man, according to Matthew, worshiped Jesus. The position there is that he's bowed down at his feet. Um, This Jewish synagogue leader. You know, he didn't he didn't have time to go alphabetical khaki and say, A, he's all Lord, you are almighty. B, you are the beloved. C, you are the Christ, the anointed one. <laughs> this was worship of a different kind. And then it says, uh, he fell at his feet. You know, every time I do this, I get out of the recording and I always feel a little bit bad for people who are watching videos. I'm sorry, video watchers. Not all eight of you. I'm very sorry. Um, <laughs> and then he says, And begged him earnestly, saying, he begged him earnestly. He's left all propriety behind. Uh, All all pretenses have been set aside. And this is what he said when he was begging. My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and then she will live. You got to hand it to that Roman centurion. You know, the non-Jew that just said, you just say the word. (laughs) But this Jewish synagogue leader says, this is how I picture it. I picture you coming, laying your hands on her, and she comes alive. He had an idea. He could imagine what it looked like. Sometimes we get ourselves in a situation is like, it's hopeless. There's no way out. We don't even bother trying to imagine it. You're just like, it's never going to work. You know, Adrian, do you do you bother to imagine what would it look like for Holly to come around? You know, what would that look like? This man imagined it. It's not this. I'm not talking power of positive thinking, by the way, here, (laughs) but I am talking about um, having a vision board where you can say I could see God doing that exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think or imagine. He can do it. And so Jairus has this notion of what it's going to look like. And he comes to Jesus and he makes a public request and says, my little daughter is on death's door. If you could come, lay your hand on her, she will live. Like, well, there's a guy that reads the paper. You know, Jesus has done that. And so in the tenderness of Jesus, as the crowd's pressing in on him, I mean, he just got done healing the demoniac. I don't know what it's, how tiring it is to wrestle with 2,000 demons, but I suspect it was a bit wearisome. He crosses the river, and what happens? A crowd meets him. A thronging crowd meets him. And then he, so his rest, his, his quest for rest gets interrupted by the crowd, and then he starts ministering to the crowd, and then that gets interrupted by the synagogue ruler. Oh, everybody. But he's not annoyed. He's not ruffled in all this. The man asks a request, and Jesus says, I I can do that. Yeah, we got time for that. Let's do it. And he begins to go towards Jairus' house. And it says, and Jesus went with him. And the great multitude followed (laughs) and thronged him. 
Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. Back in the day, and really even in, in um, third world countries, you could say a good rule of cleanliness and healthiness is to just avoid certain things, avoid these impurities. The rules in Leviticus are not just so that we can be legalistic, though we are quite good at that, but it's so that we can be healthy. And two of the ways, two of the main ways that we can become defiled are impure or unclean and perhaps hurt our health is by being around dead bodies. Of course, today we got antiseptic. We can clean ourselves and everybody knows that. And yay. And the second one is being around women who are bleeding or just blood in general. And we're going to see how Jesus deals with these impurities. It's really shocking. Mark put him, I mean, he's dealing with defiling demons, he's dealing with defiling blood, and he's dealing with defiling death. It's really uh, says a testimony to the Lord's power and willingness. So there was this woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. It's a very polite way to uh, describe her condition. And had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Unfortunately, many people know what it is to suffer at the hands of a physician or at the hand of a snake oil dealman, uh, to suffer uh, something that has a negative repercussion when it was supposed to be positive. She had an issue of blood. It was for 12 years. This is just not a physical ailment. This cost her a lot. This cost her her home. 12 years? 12 years ago when she got it, her husband stayed with her. You know, we'll find a fix for this. We can do this. And then as a year went on to year until it was like five years, the husband says, I really, I can't even be with you. You're separated from me. There's no end in sight. The physicians can't, you know, I think a divorce is merited here. And she agrees. Yes, that is true. I, and so she lost her home life perhaps even her children. So it's more than just the physical ailment, it's that she's lost her home life. What about her societal friends? What about the cribbing get togethers? What about uh, uh, hand and foot and bonco? No more, no more get togethers. You know, the friends came around every once in a while at the beginning, they all they had to do, they could go visit her, spend time with her, and then they had to go through a cleansing ritual and then the next day they could be clean. Kind of like doing your laundry. We can do this, they said. But it became a little too long, and she lost her society, her social groups. And then uh, she lost re her church group, her religious gathering. She's ostracized from her society. She's divorced from her husband, and she's excommunicated from her church, from her synagogue. This was more than just a physical ailment that was pestering her. This cost her in all aspects of life. We ought to know what that feels like just having experienced these six months in 2020, knowing what quarantine feels like and how it just depression sets on us. There is no touch. There is no interaction. Yeah, we well, thank God for FaceTime. She didn't even have FaceTime. And so you can just imagine the devastating effect it had on this woman. Each time as she's scrolling through her Facebook post and she sees a little advertisement, how does Facebook know what to sell us? You know, I'm talking about disc golfing to a friend of mine. Next thing you know, I'm getting disc golfing. So there it was. It says healing for hemorrhages. And all you have to do is put in your credit card information. She's putting in her credit card information and it ends up being a scam. But every time she scrolls through our YouTube video, our Facebook, she would see people selling a healing product and she was trying it all. She was doing all she could and it was not working. So it was very depressing for her and lonely. So, and she grew worse. Everything was the scam. When she heard about Jesus, you know how helpful it is when we hit rock bottom. If we've got anyone who's an addict in our life, we just pray, Lord, let them hit rock bottom, where they come to the end of themselves. They come to the end of their resources. They've got nothing to lose. They might as well try rehab. And that's exactly what this woman did. What have I got to lose? I've been ostracized. I've been excommunicated. I've been divorced. I'm living off the grid. If I go and try to see Jesus, what are they going to do to me? Oh, shoo, shoo. Yeah, right. I already live isolated. 
There, there was no cost. What greater cost could she pay? We're going to charge you money. Physicians took it all. <laughs> I have no problem with that. You know, but because she was at rock bottom, because she was desperate, and because it was free, this is one of those free uh, advertisements that she saw. She's like, why not? What have I got to lose? And sometimes that's the point where we need to get to for God to meet us. When we get to the end of our hoarded resources, that's where God will meet us. And so she heard that Jesus is coming town. She, she's, even though she's off grid and she's on clean, on clean, doesn't try to be around people. Jesus's name was spreading. Perhaps even some friends came and said, man, you got to try Jesus. I've heard things about him. Here, look, read this article. Then when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. She's emaciated. She's weak. There's this constant discharge of blood coming from her and no replenishment. And yet she not only musters the courage, like what's there to lose, but she musters the strength. She puts on her hoodie, puts it over her face so that no one could see her, maybe bulk up a little bit. And she makes her way into the crowd that she had no business, had no right. She was violating the law by being there. She could be defiling everybody along the way, but she pressed in anyway. Just because of that glimmer of hope. And she presses in on him manages to get by no one must have recognized her maybe the crowd was so crowded you couldn't even notice who was there maybe she's weaseling her way underneath you don't even notice and she manages to get to the behind him while he's trying to walk to Jairus's house and um she touches his garment there is no recorded history in the old testament of the garment healing anybody I don't know where she got this. Just like Jairus had this picture in mind. Jesus is going to come. He's going to lay her hand on my daughter and she's going to live. She had her own little vision board. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to touch the blue tassel, the blue tassel on his, the hem of his robe, and I'm going to be healed. Where did she get that idea? I mean, the closest thing we got like that in the Old Testament is when uh, some Israelites are having a funeral service, walking out to bury this body. And they're all in mourning and they're slowly, somberly walking out there to the grave. And then all of a sudden someone says, the Moabite marauders are coming. The bandits are coming. The bandits are coming. And they just kind of toss the body into Elisha's grave. Meanwhile, they hightail it so they don't get robbed by these bandits. And guess what happens to that body that got thrown on top of Elijah's bones? I know it's crazy. It's in 2 Samuel 13. He came alive. 2 King. Second Kings, excuse me. 13, Second Kings 13, 21. We had this discussion there in a small room. That's the closest. And that was bones. This is simply the hem of his garment. I don't know where she got the vision or why she believed, but she thought it's worth trying. I'm going to do it. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his clothes. She had this strong conviction. I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Um, sometimes there's just miracles that you don't have to imagine. Like I, I imagine that's happening. This was real, visible, uh, bona fide evidence. It stopped flowing for the first time in 12 years. When was the last time she felt that way before? She'd almost forgotten what it was like. My mom got cataract surgery and she's got her glasses on like, man, this did not go well. I, I still blurry that this is worse than it was before. And then she takes her glasses off to clean it. And she's like, huh, look at that. I can read the sign 600 feet away. <laughs> All of a sudden, for the first time in her life, she can see through her right eye unaided. And, and like <laughs> never experienced that before in her life. Well, this woman experienced what it was like before not to have an issue of blood, but it was that same sensation. Who ever thought that would be possible after spending all it? So she immediately knew that she was healed. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? 
it's not like Jesus has just eight ounces of power for the day. And that woman came and touched his hymn. He's like, oh, no, I'm down to six ounces. I got to save two for Jairus' daughter. So it's not like the power went out from him. And, oh, but it's like love. We know when love goes out from us, whether it's parental, whether it's friendship, whether it's romance. We know when love's leaving us. But do we ever run dry? Do we, do we, do we get down to two ounces and think we got to reserve this? No, and that's the way it is with Jesus' power. And another thing that's going on here is, the, is this whole impurity thing. The idea is if there's a dead body or something that's unclean and I touch it, guess what happens? That uncleanness flows my way. So in this particular instance, we would expect the woman's uncleanness to flow Jesus' way and defile him. So it's always, defilement always seems to have the upper hand when it comes to humanity. It always seems to be that which is contagious. But Christ comes along. And there's an opposite flow going on. It's his righteousness that is flowing our way. It's his health and power that flows to us rather than our defilement pestering him. <laughs> Doesn't bother me in the least. Uh, I, my cleanness flowed to that woman. That's, that's the joy of dealing with Christ, is that his righteousness flows to us, deals with our uncleanness. He makes us clean instead of us making him defiled. And so uh, he senses that power had gone out from him, and he turns, and he asks this ridiculous question, who touched me? I want to read the disciples' response here. And his disciples said to him, First of all, they said to each other before they actually got the boldness to talk to him, like, can you believe this guy? What are we doing giving our whole lives to this fellow? He's so oblivious. Who's touching me? We're in a rugby scrum right now, and he's saying, who touched me? We're like in a pile, an NFL pile up in football, and he's saying, who touched me? Where did we get this? Guy? Why are we following him? <laughs> you know, like... We just want to get to Jairus' house. That's all we're trying to do here, Jesus. And, and in their ignorance, they said, Jesus. So after they get done talking to each other and looking at each other, like, where did we pick up this guy? And, 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 and Nathaniel says to Philip, I can't believe you convinced me to follow this fellow. And, and, and Peter says to Andrew, and you think he's the Christ? I don't know really what they're saying, but they were baffled by Jesus' question here. Like, who touched me? That's ridiculous. But, uh, that's just like Jesus. We see him sometimes feigning, pretending. He knew. Uh, when when uh, the crowd was, another, another story where the crowd's, cr crowd's pressing in on him and they're hungry. And Jesus says to his disciples, what are we going to do? How are we going to feed them? And it says in John, they already knew what they were. He already knew what he was going to do. Another incident, or I think it's I think it's in Mark four, but don't hold me to that one. Is that the winds and the waves are blowing, and Jesus is walking on the water towards them, and he says, and it, and he made as if he was going to walk by him by them. In other words, we sometimes see Jesus pretending like he's getting ready to do something in order to elicit the bit for the benefit of those around him something from ourselves. He's like, you know, and I'm going to pull it out of you. I'm going to make you come to your conclusion yourself kind of a thing. And that's just good counseling, really, right there. And so Jesus did that. And so he says, who touched me? Like, I don't know. No, of course he knew. And so the disciples are baffled by this question. Um, and he looked around. He continued looking around. He listened. He heard what the disciples are saying. He's like, Oh, disciples, when are you going to learn? Um, and he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, she came and fell down before Jesus and told the whole truth. She did exactly what Jairus did, came and fell down at his feet. She came with a request, but it was private. And Jesus wanted to elicit from her a public confession. There's... Three reasons why, I, well, there's probably a bajillion reasons the way God can orchestrate things, why Jesus did this. And one is to give her an opportunity to testify, to be able to declare to the people, 
Look it, I am whole. This is what happened, Jesus. Here's the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me, God. Yes, I will. And then uh, she said, this is what's going to happen. I touched his hymn and then I was clean. My issue of blood is over. And first of all, when Jesus said, who touched me? And she came forward, she pulled back her hoodie. And everybody (gasps) gasped, drew back in horror. I think she touched me on the way in. I think I'm defiled. You know, they're all, they're all concerned. And then she says, I had this issue of blood, but as soon as I touched the blue tassel on his garment, it dried up. It dried up after 12 years, after losing all my money, losing my home life, losing my social friends, losing my church. It's healed. And so everybody right there was made aware that this woman is clean so that he didn't have to spend the next half year of her life trying to convince everybody. No, I'm seriously, really serious, but it saved her all that. And so Jesus asked, gave her that opportunity. It also gave her an opportunity to be blessed as we're going to see how Jesus responds to her. I mean, he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go into peace and you are healed of your affliction whatever the affliction is. Like we said, it's more than just physical. And so she had the opportunity to hear Jesus call her daughter, for her to be able to uh, slink away, as it were, and not feel like she stole something, not feel like she robbed somebody. She doesn't have to go away with a dirty conscience. Quite the contrary. God gives her an opportunity. Jesus gives her an opportunity to walk away with a clear conscience, a joyful conscience, and say, he called me daughter. He said this is real and it's true, and I'm going to be walking into peace from now on. But the third reason why I think Jesus had this public profession, as he's on his way to Jairus' house to heal her sick daughter, he gets interrupted, on phase, unruffled by this whole thing, and he stops and he ministers to her. You can imagine Jairus thinking, come on, Lord, come on, deal with that later. He's had that for 12 years. She'll have it for 13. She'll be there. But my daughter is on the brink of death, and he's kind of trying to reel him in, and it's not working. And so Jesus declares that she is clean and Jairus hears this. Matter of fact, maybe he even knew this woman. Who was it that excommunicated her anyway? He might have very well been the priest that had to deal with this. And he's trying to minister to her and he's trying to meet her where she's at and brings her communion. Well, whatever the equivalent of communion is, but he's trying to minister to her. And after a while, he's like, honey, I've got to you cannot come into the synagogue again. You are unclean. And he's got to say that. And he had people that were yapping at him. Well, it's about time. I can't believe you. And he had people yapping at him like, you're so mean. This is how our, this is what our pastors have to go through. That's the only reason I keep bringing that up. And, but he did that decision. And so he knew, I suspect he knew her and he looked on and he saw what transpired. He saw her boldness. He says, I can imagine that woman being so desperate she would do this thing. And when Jesus said, you are healed of your affliction, he's like, really? 12 years I've known her. I've known her from the time she was 16 or 20. And here she is, 32, 40 years old, whatever. And so his heart's like, wow, that's amazing. And then right then, guess what happens? His, he, his own psyche goes on this roller coaster ride. And this is how it goes down. Let me get my spectacles on. And he looked around and the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told the whole truth. She didn't hold anything back. What has she got to lose? And he said to her, she said, well, I stole the blessing from you. I stole your power. I know you felt power out of you because I took it. I'm so-. And he's like, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go into peace and be healed of your affliction. That whole go into peace. Go into peace in your home. Go into peace with your circle of friends. Go into peace in the synagogue. And whether they let you in or not, you will be going into peace. You've had an encounter with Jesus. You believe that all you had to do was touch me. And that is all we have to do is touch him. So she did the touching in this one. We're going to see where Jesus does the touching in the next one. So it's like he's got us coming or going either way. 
you're healed of your affliction, spiritual, mental, relational. While he was still speaking, while Jairus was hearing these things, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and they said, your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? We have faith enough that Jesus can heal her when she's sick and on death's door. Mm -hmm. But if she's dead, why bother? Oh, hum. You go from Tigger to Eeyore, mm -hmm. just like that. Uh, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid. It's often what he does when he first wants to console us in our, in our fears. And then he says, only believe. Remember this woman and the faith, what faith did for her. You too, Jairus, believe. And Jairus must have. Maybe he's one of those guys, I believe, helped out my unbelief. But he said, come on, let's keep going. Let's keep walking. He could have said, no, no, don't bother. I'll bury her. No, he's still hanging on to hope. Maybe with 2%, but he's still like hanging on to hope. And he invites Jesus to keep coming. And he per Jesus permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. That's a very interesting designation for John, but just an FYI. Then they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult or an uproar of those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? This child is not dead, but sleeping. So here you have these wailers and these mourners for the funeral. And the idea is that these mourners are there. Jesus isn't chiding them for this, this way of mourning. What these mourners were there for is that they would wail loudly that would allow the family to be able to mourn with the screaming and the horrific cries that they felt inside them without restraint, without embarrassment, without anybody thinking, oh, look at them. If you had mourners and wailers going on and flute players all making a ruckus, the family is welcome to be able to express themselves to the full. I mean, we don't do that here in America. After all, we're German, we're Lutheran, we're Midwestern. <laughs> but this is something to be said. There was so much pent up, so much strength of feelings. Just like we saw the strength of parental love at the beginning that caused Jairus to run to him. We see the strength of mourning and sorrow, of course. Wail as loudly, show us what you're... That's what those mourners were. I wish we kind of had professional mourners here <laughs> sometimes, but um, to have the ability and the opportunity with your good friends to be able to say the strength of your feelings and know they're not going to look at you cross-eyed like, back up a little bit. She's kind of losing it. Um, so there they were. And so Jesus doesn't chide the mourners. He, chide, he says, oh, she's only sleeping. And you can imagine, this is what happens. And they ridiculed him. You can imagine, they're horrified by what has happened. 12 years old, she was just beginning to blossom. And we were starting to see her own, her own will come into shape, her own choices. We were starting to see her come into womanhood. And it, oh, what a beautiful child she was. And they're crying. And then Jesus says, oh, she's not dead, she's sleeping. You're like, who are you to mock us? Who are you to patronize us? Who brought this troll? He's just doing this to rile us up, send him away. You can imagine how they're getting stirred up with anger. Like, what are you? Are you crazy? Who invite this goofy guy? And, and so in response, they're just like, you're, you're nuts. And they ridiculed him. So it's not like they go from sorrow and then all of a sudden they're bullies. They were, they were being, they felt they were being mocked. They felt they were being bullied and patronized by Jesus. And it just, not why we are sorrowing. That's just cruel. And so they ridiculed Jesus. Some people think that she really was just sleeping. Um, and that the, the people had it wrong. Whatever the case may be, Jesus will meet our needs. Lazarus is described as just sleeping and he was dead for four days. So, um, so there it is. Uh, they ridiculed Jesus because they were, they thought he was patronizing them. Well, I put that in my translation anyway, but when he had put them all outside, but he put them all outside, 
Sometimes somebody is bullying you. You've got a dream. You've got a direction you want to go. You've got a God calling. Someone is everybody saying that vision is dead. That ministry is dead. That will never work. And you say, no, no, it's just asleep. God's going to wake it up. And people are saying, oh, you're crazy. We've already tried this and tried that. And sometimes it's just good to put that outside. You can put up a boundary and just say, not, not right now. Maybe later you can, you can enter in, but right now I am staying focused. So sometimes we have to put the bullying, the naysayers and the doubts outside. And that's what Jesus did. He put them outside and he took the father. And for the first time, we get the mention of the mother here. If we were going to write another chapter in Charlotte Fritz's book, we would include this mother who had to wait for her husband to come back with Jesus. And uh, first time the mother's mentioned, and those who were with him and entered into where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand. He touched her before it was the woman reaching out to touch Jesus. Here is Jesus reaching out to touch the little girl. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated from the Aramaic, little girl, I say unto you, arise. I love this fact that Jesus does the reaching out and the touching. Sometimes we want to reach out to God. We want to be able to touch the hem of his garment, but we feel like we're, we're in a straitjacket. We can't even do that. And that's when Jesus reaches down for us. It's the uniqueness of Christianity. We have a God that reaches down. And he goes in there, he reaches out, grabs her hand, and he speaks in Aramaic, which is the language of the synagogue. It's the language that this family that's in desperation, it's their first language. Yeah, everybody speaks Greek. Alexander did great, did a great job Hellenizing the then known empire. But the, the family was most comfortable in Aramaic. And guess what? Jesus speaks to them in the language that they understand. He is the word after all. And his business is to communicate. It's not an abracadabra word. Matter of fact, it actually means little lamb arise. And so... He calls out to this little girl to arise. She immediately obeys, and immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. And they were, their sorrow, when they were overcome with sorrow, and then they were overcome with anger at Jesus for patronizing them, now they're overcome with great amazement. And he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, because he didn't want to lose his head to the rulers and Herod and the Pharisees. And then he said, give her something to eat. Very practical. And that's it. When we see God do a great work in someone's life and they're delivered, he think, let's sit around for a couple of years and talk about it. Oh, no, no. Give her something to eat. Nourish her. Teach her. Uh, uh, dine with her. Do Bible studies together. Pray with her. Be able to feed them. And so just think what it was 12 years before. There in the hospital room, a little baby is born to the Jewish synagogue leader. Look at this. We got our little girl. And at the same time, this lady is getting the word. There is nothing that we can do to stop this flow of blood. And so this little girl is going on a trajectory of growth and life and things are going good. And this trajectory is just going down the weary desolation of isolation and quarantine and depression. And both you know, one looks very hopeful. Everyone's got good vision for the little girl. And everyone's like, oh, that, that poor woman, that poor woman. But God ends up meeting them at this center point 12 years later. God can intervene in those lives that are going upward. And God can intervene in those lives that feel like they're going downward. He will meet us in the midst of our depression, our isolation, our loneliness. If we reach out and touch his him, and if you feel straight jacket, he will reach out and grab your hand, speak your language. He'll speak your language and say, arise, little lamb. And he told him not to tell anyone. Yeah, so he's concerned at this time being unveiled for a number of reasons. Um, <laughs> publicity for what he's doing and his blessings as opposed to who he is. He hasn't quite gotten anybody on the same page with him of recognizing the Messiah is coming to suffer, not to overthrow the Roman government. Also, people are starting to get riled up against him as far as the religious leaders and the government. 
And so he's like, I don't want to lose my head prematurely. God's got a timetable and it is not now. Uh, this is at the end of his second year in all actuality. And so even though it's in chapter five, and so he doesn't want it to end prematurely. So I think the se- a lot of people call it the secret uh, Messiah in Mark's gospel because he's constantly saying, don't tell, don't tell. But he told the demon guy, tell everybody. What I yes, yes, right. Tell every- <laughs> everybody what the Lord has done for you, what Yahweh has done for you, which is quite fascinating. Yeah. He's taking that credit. There, he, he said the demon guy, uh, he, the Lord, he got to tell everybody. <laughs> Well, I, but he, the demon guy was a Gentile. Yeah, he could be a Jew. And, and, and all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. Go home to your friends and tell them the great things the Lord has done for you. On the east side of the Jordan, nobody was after Jesus. Right. On the west side of the Jordan, he had problems with the religious leaders and around Jerusalem. Okay, that is what waiting. The mo- waiting mother the waiting woman with the issue of blood, waiting Jairus. He had to wait for that whole interruption to transpire. Um, For me, I ask myself, how do I handle interruptions? Say, Lord, these are, this is, I'm going to give the inner, I have an agenda for the day, but to be able to give these interruptions onto the Lord as an offering. These are your schedule and I don't want to begrudge it. 